Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. We're going to talk about landscape photography with Joe Fitzpatrick today. And if you guys remember, Joe's been on the show several times. He's really good at giving you those really, really good teachable moments. Um, the Understand Photography Show is first a podcast, so if you're wondering why we don't have any visuals, that's why. We have a a large audience as a podcast as podcast listeners and then we also put this on YouTube and on Facebook as a video so subscribe to our YouTube channel because we also have three minute three to five minute tips every Tuesday um, subscribe to I, our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or however you listen to podcasts and if you'd give us a review on iTunes boy we would really appreciate it we have a whole bunch of freebies on our website it's understand photography.com and the very first thing you see when you get to our website is it says click here for freebies so we've got some downloads and videos and um, basically what you're doing is you're giving me your email list email address in order to get one of the freebies and then you'll be on our email list we send out a newsletter once a month that's it we're not gonna spam you every day why do they do that every day I never understand that anyway today we're going to talk with Joe Fitzpatrick. Joe Fitzpatrick works here at Understand Photography. He's our lead instructor. He's also the president of the statewide um, umbrella for the camera club. So it's called the Florida Camera... Wait, I don't know what it's called. Florida Camera, camera Club, club camera. Council. <laughs> <laughs> FCCC is what we say all the time. Um, and Joe is one of those very unique people because he's very technical but he can explain things in a simple, easy way so that even people like me can understand. So welcome back to the sh this side of the show, Joe. Glad to be here, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> so now you are really into landscape photography. You are a main guy who takes everybody out into the Everglades and all that kind of stuff. So what is, like, what's your technique when you approach a landscape okay, well, shot? So you're I, just walking out there, you say, oh, this looks like a nice spot, and then what? Well, when I get to a location, the first thing I do is I get out of the car or however I got there and I walk around. I don't even have a camera in my hand. The cameras just stay in the trunk of the car wherever they are or set down wherever they are. And I'll walk around and I'll look at the scene and I'm thinking what about, about the scene attracts me? You know, why did I want to photograph this in the first place? Maybe I hike for an hour to a waterfall. So obviously the waterfall is the central subject. Or maybe I hike to get a mountain view of a landscape or a lake or something like that. So I'm looking at what is the central subject of the, of the scene. What is it that I want to emphasize? Okay, so if you are in the Everglades, we don't have very many waterfalls in the Everglades. Well, if I'm What's in the your Everglades, central subject in the, of if the I'm scene? In the Everglades, uh, in, the, in the Everglades, what we say is the clouds are our mountains. So the first thing I'm going to do there is... I'm going to pick the day when I have some dramatic clouds to, to work into the landscape because the landscapes are relatively flat in the Everglades. And then I'll start looking for reflections in the sea of grass and things like that and decide how I want them to relate to each other. So I'm looking around and I'm looking for angles. I'm looking at, I'll walk around, I'll crouch down. I may sit down or lay down on the ground or get up on a stool or something just to see what angle I want to get to capture what I want to do. I'm also looking at the relationship between the foreground objects and the background objects. Do I want to emphasize something in the foreground, a, uh, a palm tree or something like that, or am I more interested in what's in the midground or background? And that perspective between the two, the perspective is the relationship between nearby objects and far away objects. Okay. So the closer the two are to each other, the less emphasis is on one or the other okay. because they're relatively the same size as you're looking at them. Okay, But if you're real close to the foreground object, it appears bigger to you. Like if you put your hand in front of your face, it seems way bigger than something that's right. half a block away. So you know, I'm looking at that and I'm deciding and what determines perspective is not the focal length of the lens or anything else. It's strictly distance between where the camera is and each object. Okay. So if I move closer to the foreground, it's going to emphasize the foreground because it's going to look bigger in the picture right. compared to the background. If I want to get a more of the same size, I want to get further back to get that perspective between the two 
to l have less emphasis on the foreground. So they'll look closer together. They'll look closer together and more the same size. So I'm looking at that. Where do I want to be to line up what's in the foreground or what's in the background so it's not overlapping or maybe I want it to overlap or whatever. So I'm all over the place looking. So I've decided now on the scene I want and, and more or less, and then the next thing it is, okay, the framing. This is the perspective I want between the foreground and the background. So I've determined how close I need to be to the foreground. Okay. Okay. So that's your first step, that's basically. My first step. So well, your first step is to walk around. <coughs> I walked around to and decide then, and the decide the scene I liked. Okay. And this is the scene I like, so okay. And then I'm looking at where I want to be. Perspective is your first thing. To get thing. the perspective. Okay. So now I have the perspective. So then the next thing is, is framing. How much of this scene do I want to include? A little bit or a lot? Okay. That determines the focal length of the lens I use. Okay. The focal length of the lens is going to give me the framing, whether I got a wide area I'm taking in or a narrow area I'm taking in. All right. So I can be using anything from a very wide lens, uh -huh. 12, 16 millimeters, to a super telephoto at 600 millimeters sometimes because I want to compress distance. Obviously with the 600 millimeter, more realistically at 200 to 400, I need to be much further back from the near subject to get that compression. But this is useful when you're shooting something like the Smokies. And you've probably seen shots of the Smokies where it's, the mountains are actually look like cardboard layers against each other because you've done an extreme telephoto to compress them. So I'm looking at all this stuff and now I've decided on the framing and then the framing is going to decide what focal length lens I use. Now I like to use zoom lenses because I have an infinite choice of focal lengths. Mm -hmm. If I'm with a prime, one may be too wide, the next one might be a little too narrow. But if I have a range of, of zoom lenses, and I do, I have a 16 to 35, I have a 70 to 200, and then I have a 150 to 600. Okay. So with them, I can cover pretty much Everything. anything I want to. All right, so you said you use a tripod. Do you always use a tripod? No, there's probably been once or twice in my life I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm doing landscapes, yes. I'm not in a hurry, and I'm going to get a much sharper shot on a tripod. Okay. Assuming you have it on a quality tripod and not something you got for $49 that shakes when you walk up near it, you know. Okay. Uh, so I'm on a tripod, and I'm using a remote release on the camera. Okay. Wired or I've been, mostly now I've been using a wireless one. You have? So, yeah. So did I've you find a good one? I thought I did, but it just broke. Yeah, those <laughs> things drive me crazy because so, they seem on so so unreliable all yeah, the time. Yeah, I've had okay, you know, but even there, it, the reliability of them, you know, it's not a critical shot. So if it doesn't work, you can always go back. But I always, even when I have a wireless one, I have a wired one with me that I can put on there. All right, so your, your equipment is going to be, you're going to have a tripod and a remote shutter release. Right, either wired or you're wireless. You're going to have the three lenses, right, so that you have, you can cover from 16. Yeah, typically I have a 16 to 35 with me. Uh -huh. I have a, uh, a, a 24 to 105 or a 24 to 70, depending on my mood. Mm -hmm. And then I have a 70 to 200. Okay. And those lenses are all F4. Okay. Okay. Because F4, they're smaller, lighter, less expensive, and the ones I have are just as sharp, and in one case sharper, than their F2.8 equivalents. Okay. Okay. I have a couple of them in F2.8 as well, but I rarely use them because they're so heavy, that you, especially when you're doing landscapes and you're, you're schlepping them around and you're uphill and downhill and everything else. I'm with you on that one, you're man. You're not <laughs> downhill in the Everglades, but you are other places I photograph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so you've got your... Are you full frame or crop frame camera, or frame. does it matter? Well, it, if, if you're, the short answer is it doesn't really matter if all you're doing is looking at them on a monitor uh, or you're printing up to say 11 by 14, 12 by 18, something like that. You're not going to see a whole lot of a difference between uh, at base ISO. You're shooting at ISO 100, let's uh, say. Okay. At ISO 100, Assuming they're the same generation of sensor, okay, you're not going to see, you'll be hard pressed to see. What do you difference. mean the same generation? 
well, the, the one camera isn't five years older than the other. Oh, 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 okay? I see. They're, they're both equivalent sensor technology. You know, that, you know, you can't compare one now and one that was made four years ago because we've advanced the technology. So if you say I want to be a landscape photographer and I want to be, I want to sell my fine art, I should get a full frame camera is what I'm hearing you say. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, the big difference is it's going to be less noisy at base ISO, but they've gotten so good that at base ISO, the difference is less and less and less. And when you say base ISO? The, the lowest ISO that the camera okay. natively shoots at. Okay. Now, and that's usually ISO 100. Okay. I'm not talking about these. Some cameras now have an extra, extra low ISO, like they had a high and a high high, and they're not done natively. They're done with software, and they don't come out too well. So okay. most cameras are ISO 100. And you're hard-pressed with a modern camera to see the difference between 100 and 200. Okay, so the quality so, is so going to be pretty good. the quality is really good. So as long as you're not printing it, oh, I don't know, uh, 16 by 20 is fine. You can use a crop camera and you're not going to have any problems. I'm but, assuming you're not. But if you're going to be selling your fine art, you need to be printing big. Well, if you're printing That's big, my opinion. If, if you're printing big and you're printing 20 by, th yeah, well, they, I'm not talking, thing. I'm talking 40 by 60s well, well, and uh, well, yeah, I'm talking so, big. You know, somebody who says what makes a fine art photo, uh, fine art photo, and the answer is anything 20 by 30 or bigger, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old joke. But uh, yeah, if you're getting into 20 by 30, uh, 24 by 36 and bigger, the full frame camera is going to give you a nicer picture okay uh, be, uh, because it's less noisy but also today uh, there are much more pixels yeah in other words, you have 50 60 megapixels in them as opposed to the typical uh, APS-C camera crop camera is 24 to maybe 30 in that range so you have a lot more pixels in there you can get a lot more desil, uh, detail okay the trick is to get that detail you need high quality lenses. I'm talking real high quality lenses to resolve that detail. Okay, good. Uh, That's good. A lot good. of the older lenses, even the older pro lenses, were never designed to resolve that kind of detail. Okay. So you have to look at that. So your expense starts to go up. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So yeah. So, but typically, if you're just not shooting to do fine art, but you're shooting for fun and to hang it on your wall. A good crop body camera is going to give you a nice image and it's not going to be a problem. You have to remember the full frame cameras from five years ago were not as good as the crop bodies today and there's a lot of fine art out there that was uh, shot with uh, six, eight, uh, what was a 5D, uh, uh, eight megapixels, 12, something like that. I mean, real small, so. I have a, a picture hanging in the wall here in the yeah, studio yeah. over there. Nobody else right. can see it, but that uh, was with my 10D, okay. which I think was six megapixels. Yeah, six or no more than eight, probably it six. It wasn't yeah. very, but it no, was a it was, crop frame. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the first yeah. Canon right. digital yeah. DSLRs. Yeah. And I had a 300, and that was the same thing. That was 6.2. So now, I printed big stuff And it looks that. good. I think it looks yeah. good. Well, a lot of it is... But it's not a landscape, it's a portrait, yeah. so... Uh, if, if the picture doesn't have a lot of fine detail on it, you can get away with yeah. an older camera. Yeah. So, but typically, you know, landscape isn't as demanding for the hobbyist as, as some of the others. Uh, if you're into bird and flight photography, you need a camera with a real high, a really sophisticated autofocus, uh, fast shutter speeds, uh, high frame rate, big buffer size, super expensive long lenses and everything else. With a landscape, you can take a landscape with the kit lens that comes with your crop body camera and you're going to get a nice result because it's more about the technique, having it on a solid, stable tripod, using a remote, choosing uh, an aperture around f8 or f11, uh, focusing properly on it. We can talk about focusing and how I focus too. Okay, so a technique that I, I just want to, because what you just did was talked about ways to keep it super sharp, right? So yeah. you said tripod. Yeah, exactly. F8. Yeah, the key to, shutter a, the release. Key to a good landscape, the, the biggest thing about a landscape is it needs to be sharp where you expect it to be sharp. 
Okay. I, I say where you expect it because uh, you've seen some of my pictures of pilings in the water, and the water is all cotton candy. It's not sharp. But the piling has to be razor sharp, mm -hmm. or it's going to look like an out of focus photo, right? Okay. So, so to get an ultimately sharp picture, the first thing you want to do is be on a tripod, period. A good tripod, a good solid tripod. You want to use a remote cable release. You may, depending on your shutter speed, you may want to, uh, if it's a, a DSLR with a mirror in it, you may want to flip the mirror up first. There's a choice to put the mirror up before you take the picture. I don't usually do that. I don't find it gives me that much of a difference. I played with it mm -hmm. most of the time, so I won't do that, but that's another thing you can do. Uh, so that's your mechanical part. Okay. Now the next thing is where, and your other thing is the aperture you're going to use. Now, as your aperture gets smaller, higher number, going from f4 to f8 to f11, you're getting a greater depth of field around the point of focus. Okay. So more is going to look sharp around the focus point. And it's not all going to be the same sharp. The only thing that's razor sharp is the focus point, okay. period. Okay. The rest is acceptably sharp. Okay. So the further away you get from that focus point, the less sharp things get. Mm -hmm. And as you go from F4 to F8, you're expanding that depth of field, the right. things that are acceptably sharp. The problem is, and that keeps going out, F8, F11, F16. It gets sharper and sharper. It gets sharper and sharper, but there's a thing called diffraction. And what diffraction does, it's the light rays bouncing off the aperture blades. Okay. And they cause a little bit of blur. And they cause blur over all of the picture. Ah, even the focus point. Even the focus point. Ah. And typically for most lenses, the sweet spot is around F8. Okay. Now it could be more ways in each thing. I'm just using an approximation. So right. Don't everybody write in and say, oh, it's F11 <laughs> or it's F5.6 or whatever. Somewhere around F8 is usually where you're not noticing any difference. So as you stop down, go to a smaller aperture, go from F8 to F11 to F16, your overall picture is getting slightly, subtly less sharp overall. Okay. You're getting more depth of field, but the overall sharpness starts to drift off. Okay. How much? In some cases, you can barely see it. A lot depends on the lens design and everything else, but they all do that. It's, it's the optics, it's the way it works, uh -huh, okay? Uh -huh. So typically when I'm shooting a landscape, I'm shooting F8 or F11. I okay. find F11, I can get more depth of field and the diffraction is not really affecting me. Okay. So I, I probably shoot as many at F11 as I do at F8. All right, and then you started to talk about focus, now, where, to, where to focus, right? right? Now, and that's another thing that, to keep that, the that, picture sharp. That's another thing to keep it sharp. You want everything in focus. I'm assuming you want everything in focus. You're okay. doing something where you want a sharp foreground and you want everything sharp right to the horizon. Okay. Okay. So your depth of field is only so big at any given focal length of the lens. Uh -huh. First thing that affects your depth of field is the focal length of the lens. The wider the lens is, the greater the depth of field at any given f-stop. Okay, so if I have a wide lens, if I'm at f8, pretty much everything's going to be super sharp. Well, yeah, it's going to change. Sharp. It's, going to ch <laughs> it's going to change depending on where you're focusing, okay? But if I have a 200 yeah. millimeter, right. Let, let's say with the this, whole scene is probably not going to be no, sharp, no matter no, what my aperture right. is. Okay. Yeah, because your depth of field, let's say just picking an arbitrary number, let, let's say it at uh, uh, F, in a 16 millimeter lens, you have a hundred feet depth of field. Okay. You up to a 200. Now you might have 10 feet depth of field. Boom! Is really getting sharp. Sure. Now the other thing is, when you're focusing, there's what they call the hyperfocal distance of the lens. Okay. And that's the point. If you focus at that point, everything from that point to infinity, the horizon is in focus okay and acceptably sharp okay and about a third the other way it's going to be in focus because your your depth of field is typically two-thirds in back again approximations two-thirds in back and a third in front of that focus point so when you're doing a landscape no matter what lens you have 
you're focusing about a third of the way into the picture, That's basically. That's usually the way it works. I'm trying to get the most. If I wanted to really get everything, I could look up what that hyperfocal distance is. And I would put it in the kind of camera, the lens. And you, you can get apps for this. Uh, Photo Pills is one. Uh, I think DOF is the other one I use. Uh, clever name. Yeah, these. <laughs> uh, so you put that in, and it says, OK, at, at uh, 33 and a half feet, everything will be in focus to infinity, and you'll be in focus up to eight feet in front of the camera which is great information if you know what 33 and I was going to say, is. how do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I actually know somebody that has a laser measuring device, looks like a pen light, so they can measure to where that is. Wow. I mean, that's getting a little too anal for me. <laughs> I, fi I find that if you focus about a third of the way into the scene, you're there. Okay. Yeah, All so right. that's what I'll do. I'll just approximate and I'll find something that looks to be about a third of the way in and I'll focus on that and I'll lock the focus on that. Okay. Okay. You have to remember if you're uh, if you're on autofocus and you're on and it's tied into your shutter, if you move the camera you're gonna refocus. So you you now you I use back button focus, okay? So when I'm using back button focus I can put it on the focus point and I can press it and focus and then when I leave go, it's focused and pressing the shutter button is not Doesn't, going to affect not, it. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, audience, we do have some, if you do a search on our YouTube channel, we have a uh, couple different vi videos, I think, on how to use back button focus on, like on a Canon, on a Nikon, I can't remember exactly what we have, yeah. but we have a few, few videos. Joe really likes the back button focus. I tried it for about six months and I went back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went back to the shooting. front button. <laughs> yeah. It depends on what you're shooting. Uh, a lot of people swear by the back button focus. Well, And I understand the concept. It does sound good. That's why I tried it, but it just, for me. Well, didn't. one of the reasons it isn't as good for you is you shoot manual exposure. Yeah. So focusing with the front button is not affecting your is not affecting your exposure. Right. So you could focus and recompose and whatever. You've already locked in your exposure. Oh, oh I see, because other people, I always forget that people can shoot in something other than manual. Yeah. And when, they're, <laughs> when they're shooting in that, not only when they have press the shutter, not only they're focusing, but they're determining, they're, they're metering the, and determining oh, exposure. Yeah. That's and a that good can point. mess with that. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't okay, think about yeah, that. that. That's All right, so how do, we, how do we make a picture look like really like, how do we create depth? Okay, so, so we were talking about perspective and what have you. Uh, one thing you want, you're trying to create a 3D, what looks like a 3D image on a 2D space. Mm -hmm. It's flat. Pictures are flat. Still. You know, <laughs> holograms aren't here yet, you know. <laughs> uh, so the way we do that is we have a foreground object, a midground object, on a background object. All right. And there are things that we are familiar with. And when we look at a scene, things close to us look bigger than they do the same thing if it's further away. That's a visual clue that's wired into our brains. So if you have the perspective between the things, foreground, midground, and background, you have different layers and they're different sizes, it gives it a 3D effect. Because this is big, I know it's close, this is smaller, I know it's in the middle, and this is further back. All right, so give me some for instances. Like what? Like what would I have in the foreground? Okay, what would so, I have in the so, middle? So in the foreground, uh, I'm going to have some kind of objects in the foreground. Maybe like what? foliage, a rock, something, a fence post, a fence or something, something in the foreground. And then I'm going to have my midground. And maybe the midground is where the stream is coming through, and then the background is mountains all the way back. Okay, or in the case of, uh, I'm thinking one picture I just had, a landscape picture in the Everglades, uh, the foreground, I have it framed with ponds. Okay, and there's water in the midground with the, with the grass, with the reeds of the grass, and then the background is the clouds. 
So you have depth from going from the foreground to the background to the background. All right, and I just want to clarify something because I know you teach this, so I know you, but I don't think it's clear in what we're just okay. talking about. When you're talking about the foreground with the palm trees, for instance, mm -hmm. You have them on the side or on the sides because you have some type of leading right. line yeah. into the. You're not gonna, stopping no, in no, the no, front no, and there, stopping no. in the middle. We're just talking about how I create depth. You create depth by having stuff in the foreground, stuff in the midground, stuff in the background. Also, the other visual clue is with mountains and all, uh, there's a color clue too. Typically, things in the far background have a bluish and hazy cast to them. So sometimes if the background isn't, the distant mounds aren't razor sharp, it creates more of a feeling of depth, okay. which is something you want to consider when you're doing all the sharpening business. Okay. okay? Uh, what we're talking about there is uh, getting into composition. When you're composing a shot, you need to lead the viewer through the shot. From uh, Think of the foreground as your door that you're walking through and then you're walking into the midground, and then you walk to the background or whatever the subject is. And I'm talking about movement through the scene. Okay. So that movement can be guided by what we call leading lines, something that points a direction. It can be a curved line, an S-curve, or it can be a straight line, but something that works you back through the scene. All right, so, so use the example of the palm tree that right. you're in the beginning, okay. in the foreground. In that particular shot, uh, there's ripples in the water and there's uh, reeds on either side which are leading you back into the sea. So in the very front of your picture you have palm trees and you actually have the water. Yes. Right in the front. The water's right from because the front. Because you never put a, like a horizon. Right. But the, the shape of the clouds and the break in the line in the river of grass is, is a focal point that's leading you back through. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's something in the mid-ground to help you go back through. Right. So now, you're not, when you're talking Foreground, mid, the only th point I'm trying to make is when you're talking foreground, midground, and background, you're not talking like horizontal stripes of no, stuff no, to no, stop no, because no, you, no, want, you want you uh, want things leading you into the picture yeah. because think a horizontal as, line will stop. Think of it as mountain ranges. And you have one here and one, you have one in the foreground, one in the midground, one in the background. Now the other thing is we're talking about leading you through. A mistake people make is with the foreground especially, they build a wall. That's what I'm trying they to have, get at. They have, a, uh, they have something in the foreground which goes all the way across, like a fence maybe, yeah. you know, or something like that, or a wall. And it goes right across from one side to the other. There's no visual break in it. So to get into the scene, you're actually leaping over the wall to get into the scene. You need to have a break. You need to have something like when you're composing mountain ranges and you usually have the gorges between the mountain ranges and you compose them so that line takes you back through the picture. Or maybe it's uh, the famous Ansel Adams uh, picture of the Snake River. You have that perfect S-curve from the foreground as the river snakes back to the background, leading you through and there's a visual break that can take you back through there. But let's use that as an example for what you were saying the S curve, you still mm -hmm. have something in the foreground yes. and something in the middle for the depth. The okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on about lighting. So, you know, we all hear that the golden hour is the best time to take pictures of pretty much anything, you know, early morning light or mm -hmm. sunset light. Right. Um, why? Well, a lot of people think it's because of the color of the light. And it is to a certain extent. But you have to remember in Photoshop, I can get that color light at midday. I can just mm -hmm. play with the white balance and get that color. In my mind, it's more to do with the angle of the light. Okay. When the light is at a low angle like it is in the morning and evening, one, it's a little softer because there's more atmosphere it has to come through. So it's a little more diffuse that time of day, okay? But the shadows are more distinct. Mm. because the shadows are giving you more angles. A lot of people say it's all about the light. I say it's really all about the shadows created by the light. Okay. Because the, it's the shadow that molds and gives shape that the shadows define. Mm -hmm. if, I put, if I have a ball and I front light it, dead on light, you can't tell whether it's a circular disc or a round object because it's all lit the same. There's no shadow. So you have no idea if it's flat or whether it's a round ball. As the light starts to get off to the side, 
then you start to see a shadow on the other side from where the light is, and that starts to define the shape. Okay, so in, give me an example in landscapes. Okay, we're, we're shooting mountains, and we first thing in the morning as the sun's coming up, uh, the mountain range is half of any particular mountains in deep shadow, and the other half's in sunlight, so we're getting that shape to them. We're seeing the shape. Uh, we're seeing the shape in rocks and all, uh, of the, where they're dimpled, and so with a little shadow here, a little light there, and what have you. So that low light is providing shadows, which are creating interest and drama and shape. And texture. And texture. Because yeah. that's what, since we, you keep talking about mountains, I think <coughs> you don't realize you live in Florida. Anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about landscape in general. So you're but we have, we have no sure. mountains. No. But, but what we have is like in the river grass, yeah. the grass has, looks has better. Yeah. If, you, if you're shooting midday, the grass is oh, very it's, flat. It's all flat. Yeah, if you, get, if you get the light low, that grass takes on a lot of texture. Uh, because one side is shaded and you have breaks in it and they create uh, shadow patterns in there and it gives you all this great texture. Plus, the clouds themselves have more shape to them. They're yeah. not just a white blob, they have shadows on one side and they're much more dramatic. So you're getting all that, that light too. Yeah. It's creating the shadows, it's creating the texture, it's creating the shape all the time with the low light. Now, we talk about the golden hour. Well, it depends on the time of year and how far north you are as to how long that hour actually is. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you get further north, uh, especially in the winter, the sun is always at a much lower angle. Ah. So even at close to midday, it's still pretty low okay. in the sky. So you have a bigger window in where you have the dramatic light. You no longer have the gold tones, the warm tones and it's less diffuse, so it's a little harsher light, but you still have the shadows. Oh. And sometimes those harsh shadows are better than diffuse ones, depending on whether you're trying to bring out a texture or not. Okay, okay. that's so, good to know. Uh, when, when we did, uh, we went out and we did Valley of Fire in Red Rock Canyon. Uh -huh. I did them a week before Christmas. Okay. And we were shooting almost all day because the light was low. You were at, at the, where we were, the light was low most of the day, so we had a much more longer shooting time than if we'd gone out in the summer. Oh, okay. Because it was a lot com more comfortable, yeah. too, at the summer. I bet it's hot there in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> but we had, we, we could get dramatic oh. light for a much longer time oh, because that's... of the time of year and, and where you are in the hemisphere, whether you're farther north or further south. Down here, we have a fairly short window down here in Florida. Yeah, because it's, we're closer to the equator, so we have the, the, yeah. the sun up higher. We have the sun up higher okay. most of the day, and it's a harsher light as, as well. Typically. So what if I want to, what if I want to take pictures in the middle of the day here in Florida in the summer? Use an infrared, ah! use an infrared camera <laughs> is, is one thing. Uh, that, you know, infrared, uh, it seems that the works best with the harsh hot light I know. so a lot of times what i'll do when i get to the point where the light isn't there for my regular camera i have a camera that uh, has been converted to infrared which is a great thing to do with an old dslr an old dslr four or five years old is worth almost nothing so you convert it to infrared and now you have a nice infrared camera to use when the light mm -hmm. isn't quite right so you can do that the other thing is what kind of day is it you know, when we're talking this light, we're talking that they're actually light, that you can see the sun. Right. If we're talking an overcast day or a, a day when the clouds are going in and out, you can expand your shooting opportunity. You wait for its overcast time, right? And some subjects are much better to photograph, landscape subjects are much better to photograph on a cloudy day. Anything to do with a, a, a waterfall or a... Uh, a fast moving stream or brook where you have specular highlights and all that can drive you crazy. The cloudy day, as long as you don't have the sky in the shot, as long as the shot is all waterfall or all water, mm -hmm. you have less specular highlights and you reduce the uh, dynamic range so you get a much nicer photo that way. So they're the best, uh, waterfall's terrible on a, a bright contrasty day because you never find a situation where the entire waterfall is going to be in the sunlight or the shade. Mm. So you're going to have all this crazy dynamic contrast and everything, and really difficult to do. 
If you're on a cloudy day, you don't have those issues. Okay. So, and it's a lot more comfortable to hike to the waterfall on a cloudy <laughs> day. Too. So I always try to do that. Uh, the last waterfall I shot, which was in uh, just recently in Virginia, I went out there on a rainy day, and I shot it on a rainy day, and it was great. And I went back later when it was sunny to get a couple more shots and waited till the clouds came in and out and shot between the, the sunlight to get what ah, I wanted. Okay. So uh, something like that, uh, waterfalls, uh, brooks and streams, you know, where you're trying to get all right, that stuff. Right, right. Uh, what about just a standard landscape, though? I mean, and you kind of glossed over the sunny part. If it's a sunny, harsh day and you if it's sun, and you don't have an infrared camera, should you just say, well, I'm not going to take pictures? No, I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you, you pick and choose what you want. You, you look for a subject where that harsh shadows are going to help or having the light overhead is going to help the scene. Okay, uh, like, like what? All right, let me just give I'm you a, let me let me let me let me put this in your brain and see yeah. if you can come up with something. So I you know, I just got back from Italy mm -hmm. and uh, Stefano and I went out and we wanted just to see the you know, the inn where we're staying. So we were out early in the day. Mm -hmm. Not early, but like you know, sunset was like seven thirty, I think we were out at four o'clock. So it was really harsh lighting, not a cloud, not a cloud, not a cloud in the sky. And uh, he just kept going, bah, light, the light is terrible, the light is terrible, the light is terrible. I can't do it, tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have not been to Tuscany, but you've been to right. the Palouse, which is yeah, similar. 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 Yeah. So is there anything I can do what? in that harsh lighting? You have to look for a subject where you're still going to get some kind of shape and texture. So find uh, a building, like that's a, exactly what we did. Building. I mean, uh, a lot of times, like uh, uh, cityscapes. On a cityscape, if you're shooting city streets, a lot of times it doesn't matter what time of day it is, as long as you're shooting one side of the street or the other. As long you as know. one side, like not half in shade, half in exactly. light. Yeah, so, that's so hard. So a lot of times uh, on, on our Cuba workshops, we said, okay, this, this street is running north-south. So half of it's in sunlight and half's in shade. So don't street, shoot the whole street. Shoot one side or the other. And then you'll have fairly decent, you'll have much better light on the shady side, but you can also get some contrasty harsh stuff if you might want it to bring out textures in the buildings on the other side. So you can shoot pretty much all day that way. I think that's what you just said is probably the goodest, the best advice just to find really choose your subject yeah. based on the yeah, lighting because to, uh, that's what we ended up you know he's found some hay bales which probably would have been better in the low light but yeah. they still were kind of cool there was enough yeah. texture from the shadow there was enough shadow on the side of you know that they kind of came out cool and and then we went to the um the different little buildings you know they got this mm -hmm. vita letta chapel that's yeah. real famous and then we went to one of the gladiator houses and just did that kind of mm -hmm. stuff because it was so yeah. bright out until we got you know Later in the day, I forget where we went somewhere. Oh, that's when we did that cool S-curve mm -hmm. place. When I was doing Valley of Fire, our solution was that we shot in the morning until the light, and we had a longer window, like I said, but you still had a window between morning and afternoon. So we found a nice place for lunch, had some adult beverages and some good food, relaxed a little bit. We're now rested. We're up on our game again, and go back and shoot till sunset and after. And that middle of the day break makes all the difference in the world. Okay, so, so you're saying to shoot in harsh sunlight to go to the bar and have a drink. Exactly. The solution is stop and have a beer. That's the, that's the, that's the Irish solution. The Irish German solution is stop and have a beer and go back later. And a lot of times, you know, to really get a decent picture, you're not going to get it that day. You're not going to get it that day. You need to be there at a better time in better light. And it's as simple as that. And that's why you'll find that a lot of really good landscape photographers live where they shoot. That way they can be there when the light is right. If you're going to a place one week a year, your odds on getting that picture are really low, no matter how much you've researched and everything. The first time I went to the Tetons, 
I was there four days before I saw the Tetons. It was fogged in all day. Oh. I was taking pictures of lakes and stuff like that. If there were mountains back there, I only knew that because people told me there were. You couldn't see them. Okay, so. <laughs> So, you but know, I'm you glad you said that because day. that you know I mean for that is that is such tr so true because if you're you know I was with Stefano I mean we're gonna have a photo trip and hopefully we'll have good light because we're gonna get up mm -hmm. before dawn almost every day and sunset all that kind of stuff but when I was with him I had three hours right total so and it not a cloud not a cloud not a cloud in the sky ever, all the way through sunset. None. <laughs> well, well, the other thing there is, <sighs> as a photographer doing nature, landscape, you need to stop having tunnel vision. You don't get focused. So you look for other opportunities. I'll give you a good example of that. We did a workshop up in St. Augustine, which is a combination of uh, birds in flight and birds in the morning and old St. Augustine landscapes and cityscapes kind of thing in the afternoon. The first several days we had torrential downpours. They set records for the downpours. <laughs> Just on your trip. <laughs> so I know the place and I skilled it more than just birds and landscapes. So our group, I took them to the local museums. So we shot different things in the museums, which were empty because it was a literally torrential downpours all day, you know. So they were happy to see us. So we could set up our tripods. We could fool around with lighting. We shot in the museums. Uh, we shot flowers. Churches. I know you went in the church. We went, we went to churches. We did the churches. And the one day, I was, I was friends with uh, the day clerk at the, in the hotel, motel. His hobby is tropical frogs. So I have him bring in a couple frogs and some stuff to make a diorama. And we set up in the lobby of the hotel, made dioramas, and shot frogs for a half a day. I love so it. So we had a macro class on shooting frogs. Nobody got a picture of a bird or old architecture until the last day it cleared up. So I extended it. That was supposed to be half a day. So I said, OK, we'll shoot a whole day. So we went, and everybody got great birds in flight pictures. At, 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 the, at the rookery, okay? But we were flexible. There were other groups there that weren't flexible. They were birds. All they wanted to do was shoot birds, both the workshop leaders and the people in the workshops. And they would try to shoot a little bit in the pouring rain. So they'd be out for an hour at the expensive year. They'd come back to the hotel. They're all miserable. They're sitting around all day, not having a good time at all. We had a great time. And we had great photos because we were flexible and we said, OK, if we can't do this, there's other stuff to shoot. We're photographers. We take pictures. OK, we know how to do this, so we'll find something. If it's that harsh day, go find some shade with some flowers. Yeah. Shoot some flowers. Yeah. Go inside. Do this. Shoot the inside of the bar where you're having the beer in the <laughs> But don't get so focused, oh, I have to shoot this picture of the stream with the clouds and all that because that's what I came here for. Well, you came here for that, but you can't get it. Get over it. Start looking for what you can shoot. That's good advice. All right, so let's wrap it up with some, uh, okay, so you talked about scoping out mm -hmm. where you're going to go. And, you know, I've been with you when you've, well, we've done together where we're looking for yeah. spots in the Everglades because yeah. we do tours in the Everglades. It's what we do mm -hmm. here. And... Uh, you know, a lot of times it's just the side of the road yeah, we pull over. It, it can be anywhere. Because you, you have to keep your eyes open for, for what you want. So right? we pull over the side of the road, and then you walk around mm -hmm. without the gear. Right. I, have, looking, I always have a camera on me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm walking around with, with, without the gear, and I'm looking at the scene and deciding what I want to emphasize in the picture, what I like about it, what attracts me to this, okay, and that's what I want to emphasize. So where best can I do that? What kind of perspective do I want? How close can I get to it? Now, sometimes I'm limited on that because, you know, there's a cliff there. You know, well, they're not in the Everglades, but maybe, you know, this that's is where the, the water, water starts. there, and there's the gator looking at me, and yeah. that's his side, and this is my side, <laughs> and we're going to stay on our sides, you know, and <laughs> that way we're both happy. So I can't put the tripod there. You know? Right, right. My permit, he doesn't 
He doesn't care about he doesn't your care about commercial the use permit. He doesn't permit. care about <laughs> my, my CUA, my commercial <laughs> use permit. He, the alligators just ignore them. So you have to think about that. All stuff right. Too. So you find your want. spot. I find my spot. I decide exactly what I want to do. I set up. I have my framing. So that's your second thing is decide on the framing, I decide on, which I decided helps you on the framing pretty much before I do it. Okay. So then I, based so you on choose the your framing, lens. I, I select my lens and okay. then I get set up. I get my focus where I want it. Focus I select a third my of the focus way point, in. maybe focus a third of the way in. I'm typically shooting at F8 or F11 or somewhere in that range there. And almost always at ISO 100. Almost always at ISO 100. So the my shutter, shutter speed is going to be what it is. You're going to measure except, the light. Oh. Except. Except. Okay, so I'm in this scene, and uh, so so uh, I'm shooting at ISO 100. Now, a sunny day, it isn't a problem. So it's sunny, sunny day, ISO 100. Uh, I'm shooting at F11, let's say. So my shutter speed is going to be 200th of a second, 250, which is fine. And you're going to determine that by measuring? Yeah, with I'm the meter, I'm you're metering. Light, but I know that's what it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's fine because if there's motion, if there's a breeze and there's motion in the, the reeds or whatever, 250 is going to be enough to freeze it. Okay. If not, I'll go to 500, I'll go to F8. Still at ISO 100. So I'm fine, I can freeze it. But let's say it's an overcast day. Uh huh. And let's say it's really windy. Okay. So now I have to freeze. I have to have a fast enough shutter speed to freeze the motion to get the foliage sharp. Uh -huh. So I, I may not be able to do that at ISO 100. So I may need to shoot ISO 200 or ISO 400 just to get the scene to freeze the motion in the scene. You think landscapes, there's no motion. Well, there's always a breeze, you know, most of the time, except if it's Arizona, it's 105, and then you can't find a breeze. Yeah. You know? but, 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 there's always a breeze there, so you have to take this into consideration that the, the trees and all may be moving and you'll need a high enough shutter speed for that. So you may not be able to shoot at ISO 100. You may have to kick it up okay. to 200 to get it. Okay, that's good, okay. That's good advice. Another, well, I'll get off topic for a minute there too. Uh, shooting uh, streams mm -hmm. or waterfalls. And you want a slow shutter speed to get a silky water, let's say. Okay. I mean, it depends on what you like. Some people like them frozen. Some people like real cotton candy. Some people like it in the middle. Some people like them all. Yeah. Like me. Okay. I like everything. As, as do I. <laughs> so, so you want a real slow shutter speed to get the blurry effect. But it's a windy day. Uh huh. So if you get the waterfall effect and it's all blurry, your foliage is going to be blurry too. Oh, because yeah. it's moving around. Okay. Right? The solution is you take two photographs. Ah. Okay. Same f-stop. Okay. So you have the same depth of field in both. Okay. Take one at a shutter speed fast enough to freeze the motion of the foliage, one slow enough for the water to blur it, and combine them together as layers in post, you know, combine them together in post in Photoshop or another similar program to get, keep the sharp parts of the foliage and the blur shot, blurry parts of the water. You can take two shots and combine them together. Okay, and you're doing that using a layer mask? Yeah, you can use layer mask for one. There, there's um, one of those other layers does that too. We'll pick out stuff. There's a couple different ways to do it. Okay. I'll usually just use a layer mask and just because you don't have to be real precise. So I'll just cut out the water onto the other one and it's fine. It looks good, you know. Okay. Because typically around the water, it's rocks, so it doesn't matter which scene they're in as long as the exposure is the same for both, right? Okay. And All they'll right. be the same brightness, so you can blend it in real easy, and you're just cutting in the water. That would be a good short video yeah. for you to make. Yeah. By the way, I'll put it on. <laughs> I always find a, jobs a, for it, Joe well, to it's do. In couple, it's in a couple of my presentations. Too. Uh. But that, we got off the subject, but that's another thing. We're talking about sharpness, and that's important because a lot of people, you have to remember that everything in a landscape is not solid. The foliage is moving. That is really, yeah, because I don't think a lot of people that teach you're, that, you're so not. that's really a good Even tip. Even clouds are moving. So depending on how sharp you want the cloud, 
is going to depend on the shutter speed too. Yeah, you know? yeah. And we have a whole show, a really good show with Satesh Ramjatan mm -hmm. about long exposures. If you want to look that up, you can just do a, it's all, everything's on our, everything is on our website, understandphotography.com. And our website is really easy to search. There's a little magnifying glass. If you just put long exposures, you'll get any blog article, video, anything that we've ever done, all our YouTube videos, everything is on our website. So go to our website. We've got such good stuff on there. I, we work hard on that website. <laughs> we put a lot of time into all of this stuff that we hope is you know, giving you value. All right, Joe Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for being on the Understand Photography Show. And now you are committed to doing another Tuesday photo tip on the blending those two. Okay. Because mm -hmm. that's a really good, that's a really good tip. I like that okay. one. <laughs> I have what, one coming up on uh, focus blending too. What's, uh, what, what projects, well you got, okay, so one project you have continuously coming up is we've got these Tuesday photo tips right. coming out. So either Tuesday you or I do tip. one yeah. every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yes. What else is happening with well, Joe Fitzpatrick? I have, uh, I have Everglades trips coming up uh, in Jan. I have one in January and one in February, I believe. They're four-day Everglades trips. Uh, we take you into the Everglades for four days. Uh, very intensive, but it is a dry walk. We don't get wet. I know where to shoot the stuff without getting my feet wet, <laughs> unless maybe it's raining. But uh, <laughs> so we have the four, two four-day Everglades trips. I have a. And those are January and February, January and 2020. February, yeah. Yeah, 2020. They're on our website. Remember right. I told you how good our website is? And we, are, <laughs> uh, we are one of three uh, photography organizations that are licensed to take you into the Everglades. Oh, there are three now, huh? I believe, well, maybe it's just I two. It I thought it was just two. I thought, well, maybe there, I thought it was three. But uh, So you have to watch that when you go in that you're with somebody who's authorized to be in there. You know? Yeah, because it's a felony <laughs> if they're out there doing photo trips in, in National Everglades National Park. By the way, so anyway, which irks me uh, that they all are doing it. <laughs> we have those two trips lined up. I also have day trips into the Everglades as well. I have a, uh, a trip I'm excited about that we've done uh, once before called the Forgotten Coast. And the Forgotten Coast is the Apalachicola region of Florida up in the Panhandle. And it's very old Florida, old buildings, old boats, uh, a place called the Dead Lakes, which is really awesome it's this huge i forget how many acres this lake covers but it's filled with old cypress stumps these huge cypress stumps uh, some with a little new growth on them and we shoot there first thing in the morning and uh, it's just fantastic stuff and, and clyde butcher has been up there uh, shooting and you can see some of his stuff as well as some of mine you can see a lot of my stuff on from up there on my website you can see it there as well as uh, a little bit more on our understand photography one too. Okay. So those are the big trips coming up. I'm looking forward to that. And that's in March. That's May, I think. It's anyway. It's 2020 in yeah. the spring. And, and also, uh, you mentioned I'm the uh, president of the Florida Camera Club Council, the F3C. <laughs> uh, we have our conference and trade show show coming up the first weekend in March. March 2020. March 2020. Mm -hmm. it might be the second. It's the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Yeah, okay. that'd be the second weekend, I guess. Okay, that's and that great. is in Fort, Fort Myers, Myers Florida. Florida. Yeah, and that's uh, March of 2020. And we'll have, uh, we have a great lineup of speakers. We have 13 or 14 major speakers there, uh, recognizable names. We have a trade show there. We have shooting opportunities. We have workshops, the whole thing. It's a three-day affair. It's fantastic. It is a really good conference, and it's crazy cheap for a whole weekend. I think it's less than two hundred dollars, yes, right? Is. Yeah, yeah. Which, I, it's uh, it's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. To me, that that you can get so much good well, stuff in one weekend. Well, the thing is, see, we're a we're a council of camera clubs, and we're we're not a for profit for business. So the price we charge covers basically the cost to present it. You know, we're. We're not making huge amount. We're not making the kind of money you would need to to do it as a commercial enterprise. Right. Everybody so, volunteers. Yeah. I mean, it's all you work your volunteers. you work your butt off yeah. on that. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much run all by volunteers, and, and and this is why it's successful at the price it is. Now you also do a tremendous amount of private uh, instruction right. and private tours because, in fact, most of our Everglades tours are private tours. So. 
if anyone is interested in coming down to the Everglades or anywhere, actually anywhere in yeah. Florida uh, that we we're familiar with, we could tours, do private uh, tours. And, and again, uh, wide range. So we do cityscapes, we do nightscapes, we do star photography, we do a landscape, obviously. We do birds, uh, we do other animals. We do the whole thing on the tours. On the private mentoring, uh, if you probably picked out from our Tuesday tips, I'm the Lightroom guy, so if you want to learn a Lightroom, uh, we do that with private mentoring. And I do that both on a personal basis, one-to-one, -one, at your location if you're here in the uh, southwest Florida, but I also do that internet-based where we use Skype or actually go to meeting, uh, and we can do that one-to-one -one with you in your location wherever you happen to be in the world and me here. And he also has a couple of really good online Lightroom classes, again, on our website, understandphotography.com. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time.